Interesting to note, of course, is that the initial shake isn't necessarily the biggest killer for these things. Christchurch, New Zealand, the majority of the fatalities happened in the aftershocks. Just something to be aware of. After a building's compromised, you don't re-enter it. Uh, here's some of the liquefaction photos. There's the car submerged in the middle of the street. You see the building that has literally fallen over. That sewer manhole used to be at grade, but when basically a tube full of air is surrounded by uh, liquefactable terrain, it begins to float. So it floated up and then it resolved solidified and now it's several feet above grade. God. Here's some of the tsunami stuff. You see a gigantic catamaran on top of a multi-story building. And then of course the picture on the right is actually a tsunami barrier there in Sendai Bay and the tsunami overstepped that barrier. Japan's only problem there was they didn't believe that that fault line was gonna rupture at the magnitude it did. So because of the excess energy, their tsunami barrier was not at all uh, prepared for that. Here in the United States, of course, we have zero tsunami barriers. So in Japan, at least that absorbs some of that energy. Here are our inundation zones in the state of Washington. Uh, these next several slides I'm gonna go through very, very quickly, but you'll get the gist. Of it. The red is bad. Bottom line here is that on this slide, it talks about a total reduction in capacity of 45%. It's important to realize that these slides are talking about structural capacity only. This, this slide is telling us that 45% of our hospitals will be gone, but it's not talking about the ability to handle patients because you're still talking about an environment that has no power, no potable water, no sanitation, the traffic infrastructure is damaged, so the actual ability to, damage, to handle patients is something significantly less. And fire stations here that says one third of our capacity, but again, that's structural. And then you have to remember that a lot of those coastal fire departments are volunteer fire departments and may not be manned at all at this point. Police stations here, 50% uh, of, our, of our law enforcing capacity throughout Western Washington. Transportation, air, sea, and rail, the bottom line here is uh, there's no surviving lines of communication initially. We have, to, we have to forge them to bring commodity into Western Washington. Here's a, a map of the highway system or the road system in Western Washington. The real takeaway here is that there's no surviving ground routes to the coast and even in the metropolitan areas, the, it's so damaged that the transportation becomes very difficult. When you combine that with the loss or impact to bridges here, you see 7,000 bridges in the state of Washington. The bottom line is you end up with what we'll call micro uh, micro islands of traffic ability. And I think Mr. Buck will talk a little more about those. Um, and then last but not least for my slides here, the planning factors, these come straight out of the FEMA study, the high track study that was published in December of 13. Um, when you look at some of these numbers, they're really astounding. You see there uh, about 85,000 combined total evacuee, medical evacuees between nursing homes and hospitals. And you see about one and a quarter million people that meet, need mass feeding and hydration. And that's talking about immediately after the first shake and the first wave of the tsunami. As time goes by, those, those numbers get significant significantly worse.